All good? Good afternoon. Can you hear me? Est-ce que ça marche? Does it work? Ça marche? OK. Bon, très bien. Alors, uh, soyez bienvenue. Hello, I'm Andrea Lucard. I'm the Executive Vice President uh, Corporate Affairs at uh, Medicines for Malaria Venture. And it's my great pleasure to, uh, to, to do an initial introduction just on behalf of the um, product development partnerships who are the ones who are co-sponsoring this, this meeting. Um, we are, in addition to Medicines for Malaria Venture, uh, Drugs for Neglected Disease Initiative, FIND, the Foundation for Innovative Diagnostics, IPM, IVCC, PATH, and TB Alliance. And together we represent, as a group, many of the innovators who are providing the products for this important work of the Global Fund. For the sixth replenishment, obviously we have products that are in our pipeline that will be used during this replenishment and during this, during this period. But what it becomes extremely important, of course, is that we're able to keep the pipeline going and allowing ourselves to keep the innovations going so that this process can continue to fight these terrible diseases. It is my great pleasure to introduce uh, the, uh, the superman of today, who is uh, Mark Chataway, whose uh, organization, he's coming to us from Wales, his organization is Hyderis. I looked this up on the World Wide Web before we came, and it means confident. Is that right? C'est-à-dire confiant. Alors, confiance, 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 confiance. c'est-à-dire confiance, voilà. excusez-moi. Je vais prendre mon test, de, mon examen de français pour la Suisse, pour être suisse, hein, sans quelques jours. Alors, il faut savoir les, les mots. Thank you very much, um, Mark, for being, keeping Merci us on time Marc and doing the introductions and leading us forward. Thank, thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for being here. Merci à vous tous so th avec thank you. My main job Merci today is to disappoint you. Well, one, I, I don't look at all like Superman, so first disappointment. The second is that we have an extraordinary group of speakers, and I'm going to tell all of them that they can't speak for nearly long enough. So I apologize in advance, but we were given this slot by the organizers, uh, and uh, I think inevitably as an audience, you will feel you want to hear more from every single person who's going to speak. Um, our our, our uh, format today is that we're going to hear initially from the, the, the five senior speakers you can hear to see on stage, and then we'll have two groups to talk about uh, innovation in its early stages and in its later stages. Um, so that's the format, and I know a couple of you have submitted questions which we'll do our best to include in the panels. So, uh, without any further delay, may I invite Monsieur François Rivasseau, who's the permanent representative of France, to the, U to the uh, United Nations office in Geneva. Merci beaucoup. Euh, très heureux de vous accueillir à Lyon euh, pour cet événement euh, très important. Euh, et je voudrais euh, remercier, euh, bien sûr, DNDI pour euh, euh, son travail. Ce n'est pas un travail de Superman, c'est un travail... Vous savez, vous, nous avons en France la, la fable du, euh, du lion et du rat. Et il faut ronger les mailles du filet qui empêchent le développement de l'innovation. C'est ce que vous faites avec les PDP. C'est ce que nous reconnaissons aujourd'hui et ce que nous sommes heureux de saluer. Nous sommes heureux de vous rendre hommage. Euh, vous avez un événement, euh, euh, messieurs, chers délégués, euh, mesdames, messieurs, euh, tout à fait passionnant. Parce que euh, l'innovation, vous savez que c'est un thème qui est extrêmement cher euh, à la France. Nous avons investi beaucoup en matière d'innovation euh, historiquement. Peut-être parce que nous avions la chance d'avoir euh, un réseau de recherche et de médecins excellents. Mais euh, pour nous, l'innovation, c'est la clé du succès. Et parce que c'est la clé du succès, il euh, est très important de euh, réfléchir lorsque il y a des initiatives comme celle de DNDI qui permettent d'avancer, je dirais, à pas de géant. Hein, si vous ne voulez pas être Superman, je dirais que vous avez quand même les bottes de cette lieu. Et... Euh, Honnêtement, honnêtement j'espère que cet événement, il va euh, vous permettre de présenter les résultats déjà obtenus dans le cadre des PDP. Il va vous permettre d'identifier les prochaines étapes 
euh, telles que, par exemple, elles sont ressorties d'une consultation récente entre les institutions euh, internationales, euh, le Fonds mondial, l'OMS, d'autres encore. Et puis j'espère que vous accepterez de partager avec l'audience euh, l'expérience, euh, expéri vos expériences sur les principaux défis de la santé mondiale, afin de définir les prochaines actions concrètes euh, que nous pourrions mener pour euh, améliorer à travers l'innovation notre combat contre les trois pandémies. Si je peux ajouter un petit mot personnel concernant ce que je vois dans ce domaine depuis Genève, je vois que l'innovation euh, aujourd'hui, toutes les institutions qui sont présentes à Genève depuis euh, le Fonds mondial, Gavi, United, euh, Malaria, euh, et bien sûr l'OMS et, et, et ONU-SIDA, tout le monde maintenant travaille de manière spécifique sur l'innovation. Et nous, nous en sommes extrêmement heureux. Mais ce que nous souhaitons, c'est que tout le monde ne travaille pas de son côté, mais qu'on se réunisse autour de projets communs et de synergies communes. Et c'est en ce sens que l'événement d'aujourd'hui, j'espère, va beaucoup nous servir. Bravo. Merci, monsieur. Merci. Et j'aurais dû, euh, dû dire qu'il y a un service de traduction euh, qui est disponible. I, I see that everybody has headphones, but I forgot to mention it. So if anybody needs headphones, channel one for French and channel two for English, I apologize. Um, so it's my very great pleasure now to introduce um, uh, Madame Michelle Bocuse, who is the director general. L'envoi du directeur général pour les affaires multilatérales à l'OMS. Merci. Nous vivons en ce moment une période très importante pour la santé mondiale. Euh, la, les chefs d'État et de gouvernement réunis à, à New York très récemment pour l'Assemblée générale ont adopté une déclaration politique très importante sur la couverture santé universelle. Et en même temps, il y a eu aussi, et je rejoins ce que vient de dire l'ambassadeur à propos du travail ensemble, il y a eu aussi un, un plan d'action pour la santé mondiale pour, et pour le bien-être qui a été adopté et qui fait travailler ensemble 11 agences, dont bien sûr 12 agences, pardon, 12 agences, bien sûr, dont le Fonds mondial et dont beaucoup d'agences se présentent ici. Donc je crois que c'est vraiment un enjeu majeur et nous sommes à un autre enjeu majeur maintenant qui est cette conférence de, de reconstitution. Donc lorsque nous essayons d'unir nos forces pour pouvoir délivrer des résultats de santé dans le monde, je pense que c'est vraiment le moment opportun, idéal pour réfléchir au rôle de l'innovation et des innovateurs et tout particulièrement les partenariats pour le développement de nouveaux produits, les PDP comme on les appelle. Sans des outils innovants et sans des approches innovantes, nous ne pourrons pas être sur la trajectoire de 2030. Nous ne pourrons pas délivrer les résultats attendus. Nous ne pourrons pas atteindre les notamment les populations les plus vulnérables avec les services dont elles ont besoin. Donc sans l'innovation, nous ne pouvons pas accélérer notre approche, des, notre accélération vers les, les objectifs du développement durable. Pour l'OMS, il est clair qu'une alliance très forte avec les PDP est absolument cruciale pour atteindre nos buts. Votre contribution à la santé globale est essentielle et grâce à tous ces efforts conjoints, les, les outils de prévention, de diagnostic, de traitement qui ont été développés notamment pour les trois pandémies, le VIH, la tuberculose et le, le paludisme, sont là et il y en a encore beaucoup dans le pipeline. Donc on sait que l'avenir aussi est plein de plein d'espoir. Mais évidemment, il faut que nous travaillions ensemble pour éliminer les goulots d'étranglement, qu'ils soient sociaux, économiques, opérationnels ou aussi en, en termes de régulation. Et là, l'OMS jouera bien sûr son rôle. Je reviens au plan d'action euh, qui a été adopté au plan d'action conjoint des 12 agences, comme le euh, rappelait Maraïk, qui a été adopté à New York. Il y a un, ce qu'on appelle des accélérateurs, c'est à dire des programmes pour aller plus vite et notamment l'un d'entre eux, porte sur la recherche et le développement et l'innovation. Et donc des actions concrètes, cinq actions concrètes ont été adoptées qui vont d'ailleurs de meilleur alignement des priorités de recherche sur les, OD, les objectifs du développement durable, mais aussi d'essayer de voir comment transférer le centre de gravité de la recherche en fait, des pays à haut revenu à l'ensemble du monde, au reste du monde. Et assurer aussi qu'on va avoir de nouvelles trajectoires vers la recherche et le développement. Et encore une fois, éliminer les, euh, les goulots d'étranglement. Donc c'est un effort mondial sans précédent pour réduire la charge de ces trois pandémies qui a apporté des 
progrès absolument remarquable dans les 15 dernières années. On y reviendra dans les deux jours encore qui vont suivre. Toutefois, il reste encore des obstacles à franchir. Le prix des produits et des interventions reste trop cher et les systèmes de santé ont parfois du mal à suivre, surtout dans les pays en crise. Et donc, les populations vulnérables restent un enjeu majeur pour nous. Et l'innovation va nous permettre sans doute, avec de nouvelles solutions, de pouvoir mieux les attendre. Et c'est vraiment notre espoir pour les prochaines années. L'OMS, ces deux dernières années, a subi et continue à subir un processus de transformation vraiment important pour essayer de rendre notre redevabilité, nos résultats, notre impact et ne laisser personne au bord du chemin. Et dans cette démarche, le docteur Tedros a choisi de mettre la science en avant en créant un poste de... de comment appelle t ça en français Scientifique en chef, je ne sais pas si on peut dire ça, chief scientist, un scientifique qui va justement essayer de, de pouvoir travailler mieux sur l'innovation, la recherche et donner plus de cohérence. Et donc tout un travail a d'ailleurs été fait avec toutes les agences présentes ici au mois de juillet avec des recommandations qui sont en train d'être finalisées et qui vont permettre de pouvoir améliorer encore euh, notre action conjointe. Je reviens à ce dont j'ai parlé tout au début, la couverture santé universelle. Donc euh, une des pierres angulaires pour avancer vers la couverture santé universelle, c'est aussi un financement qui soit durable et prévisible. Nous savons que nous n'atteindrons pas la couverture santé universelle si euh, nous ne protégeons pas les communautés les plus vulnérables de maladies dont on sait qu'on peut les protéger. Nous n'y arriverons pas si euh, les dépenses personnelles de la poche des patients restent trop importantes. Nous n'y arriverons pas si nous ne renforçons pas les systèmes de santé. Et donc, nous avons besoin aussi de pouvoir euh, être présents partout pour euh, essayer de, de régler les problèmes des différents déterminants de la santé. Donc nous sommes, l'OMS soutient pleinement et met tout son poids derrière la reconstitution du Fonds mondial, la sixième reconstitution. Nous avons besoin de, ensemble d'atteindre les cibles de, de 2030. Nous n'y arriverons pas si nous n'avons pas les financements nécessaires pour cela. Et donc nous appelons évidemment à ce que la santé globale et, et le Fonds mondial puissent être pleinement financés. Nous pensons que le, cela permettra en fait de rendre la transformation et le changement possible. Et le succès du Fonds mondial sera notre succès à tous. Et nous y sommes très attentifs. Merci. Merci, madame. Merci. So I, I think the ambassador and uh, uh, and uh, Madame Bocos have really set Merci us uh, on, on our part here, right? Uh, understanding that innov uh, innovation is key to success. And as they both said, we won't meet the ambitious targets which have been set uh, without science, without innovation, and, and without that pipeline full of hope. Uh, and this is a unique opportunity. So I'd like to invite um, uh, Marijke Weinrocks from uh, the... Uh, Mijn Nederlands is... Marijke Wijnrocks. From the Global <laughs> Fund to talk a, a little bit about how the fund is planning to use that framework which, uh, which Madame Bocuse has, has set out. For. Thank you very much, Mark. And really nice to see you again. It's been a while. Um, so we're here today, in uh, this week, in Lyon for the replenishment of the Global Fund. And it's very obvious that more financial resources uh, to a successful Global Fund replenishment, but also increased domestic resources will help, will be fundamental for ending, if you are to end the three diseases. But just more money is not enough. We also need innovation, we need better tools. I think that's where you have the linkages. And I've been with the Global Fund for six years now. And in those six years, I've seen quite a lot of innovations and new products become available, new drugs for HIV, for TB, new formulations like pediatric drugs, uh, new diagnostics. Uh, together with Unitate, we're rolling out the next generation of bed nets. So we've seen... Um, Uh, new innovations, new tools become available. But we also know there's uh, a lot of really great work uh, going on. Um, and, and the organization that pulled together this session is some of the key players in that field. But we also know that uh, the coordination is not always optimal, that there is a huge pipeline, but we have difficulties collectively to prioritize what the product that should move forward uh, faster. Uh, how do we move those promising products 
as fast as possible through the entire cycle? And how do we make sure that they meet the needs of the people that will need them and will be affordable and that access can be guaranteed? Um, so that's why, uh, to discuss those, all those issues, we hosted and coordinated with the PDPs and WHO a meeting in July that uh, Michelle referred to uh, tackling bottlenecks and impede access to health innovations. And that indeed was, um, I had to travel last minute, so I missed the meeting, but from my colleagues who were there, uh, they told me it was really um, a very important discussion that will be followed up and that we will connect with the work that is going on under the accelerator that Michelle uh, referred to on uh, research and development, innovation and access that's happening under the Global Action Plan. Because this is a really important agenda where um, collectively we can do better to leverage all the great things that are happening uh, in all of these organizations. For the Global Fund, we will continue to keep a very close eye on the innovations and on the research pipeline, but we will not get engaged in the upstream work because we think that's not our role and other people um, um, are much better equipped to do that. Uh, we work very closely with Unitate, um, which is basically, and uh, see Sana sitting here, um, basically the intermediary between what's happening in the, the, the R&D field, the innovation field, and what the Global Fund is doing much more downstream. So we work very closely together to look at um, uh, the priorities for RFPs. Uh, we engage very closely, and uh, we will remain very active in this discussion, be it in follow up of the uh, July meeting in the um, accelerator under the WHO Global Action Plan because for us innovations and the new products that will become available as a result of all the work that we're doing is incredibly important to help us to move forward our mission. Thank you, and, and, and I think you've, you've really set out for us why it's so important. So, from somebody who important. has clearly well, distanced themselves from upstream to somebody who is very definitely upstream. <laughs> 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 qui est franchement en amont. Maybe I can introduce Catherine Je vais vous présenter Catherine Boema. C'est un PDP qui travaille dans la diagnostique. Donc c'est un vrai plaisir d'être parmi vous pour représenter les partenariats de développement produit PDP. Comme une communauté innovateur, nous avons calculé que nous avons fait 35 innovations dans les dernières décennies, certaines qui ont joué un rôle critique dans le programme de but there's 55 more innovations in the pipelines across prevention, vaccines, bed nets, diagnostics, um, and, and, and new treatments. And all of those um, could reach uptake much faster as long as we work together and achieve that, and as long as we speak with one voice and address problems with one voice. So it's great to see this follow-up meeting after the 12th of July meeting um, you know, that we convened together, in which we identified basically 10 key barriers and bottlenecks to rapid uptake in countries. Um, uh, and, and very concretely identified work streams that could help us to overcome some of these problems, which by and large center around financial barriers, regulatory barriers, policy barriers, but then also in some ways smaller operational barriers. And of course, it's also important to capitalize on mechanisms that, that have been set up for malaria, TB, and, and, um, and HIV, and drive uptake of other innovations that are needed to strengthen primary health care uh, settings and, and achieve UHC more broadly. Um, so, you know, really using these mechanisms for, for these diseases, I see Bernard sitting here from DNDI, for example, for diseases like hepatitis, etc., is, I think, very important for all of us. And, and, you know, and we really saw that the, this first meeting has allowed us to, to make steps in the right direction. So I'd like to close this with a call to action. We're looking for people that are willing to engage in these individual work streams to resolve barriers together with um, WHO implementers and the innovators. And as I said, I really the aim of the July meeting as well as this meeting is to bring in the innovation community closer overall to the implementing community and, and really create an interface that I think has has not existed sufficiently in the past.
Thank you very much. Thank, thank you, Catherine. And indeed, uh, uh, Dr. Bernard Pécoul and, and many of the other uh, giants who the ambassador referred to will be joining us in our panels uh, in, in a few moments. Uh, just to, to finish this session, may I, may I first uh, welcome His Excellency the Health Minister of Zambia, who's also going to join us for one of our, our later sessions. So thank you, sir. Thank you for being here. He's going to be part of our, our final um, uh, session, in fact, um, where we're talking about how to get health tools to impact. So it's, it's good to have you with us, sir. Um, for the final uh, speech in this session, uh, if I could introduce um, Estelle Tifone Diawara, who is the Director of Partnerships and Capitalization at Coalition Plus, and who will give us a perspective of, of people who are affected by the diseases we're discussing today. Merci. Je vous remercie pour cette prise de parole. Donc, je vais parler au nom de Coalition Plus, qui est une union d'associations euh, de pays plutôt francophones et hispanophones, présentes euh, dans 52 pays à travers le monde. Euh, on rassemble une centaine d'associations. Euh, ce qui est intéressant dans ce modèle, c'est que nous avons une gouvernance partagée, c'est-à-dire que l'ensemble de ces associations sont preneuses de décisions et on décide ensemble de ce qui est bon pour les communautés et les personnes euh, qui font partie de nos associations et qui sont donc à notre conseil d'administration. Notre membre français est l'association Aide, que vous connaissez certainement, euh, et que je vais aussi un petit peu représenter aujourd'hui. On m'a demandé d'intervenir sur le sujet du point de vue des communautés. Alors l'innovation, oui, bien sûr. Merci, monsieur l'ambassadeur, pour dire que l'innovation est la clé du succès. Je rajouterai juste quelques mots quand elle est, quand elle est accessible pour tous et toutes. Sinon, elle ne sert à rien. Donc de notre côté, nous travaillons avec les populations qui sont marginalisées, qui sont bien sûr les premières victimes des politiques répressives de, des pays dans lesquels nous habitons, dans la majeure partie de ces pays. Et c'est particulièrement vrai quand on parle d'innovation. Comme je l'ai dit, l'innovation pour l'innovation, très bien, mais elle devient intéressante euh, quand elle est utilisée pour mieux lutter contre les pandémies, VIH, tuberculose, paludisme, hépatite et bien d'autres, pour améliorer la santé euh, des personnes et qu'elle puisse être au bénéfice des communautés, des ONG, du système de santé, qu'il soit public ou communautaire et des pays pour évidemment généraliser l'accès à la santé pour tous. Donc je ne répéterai pas ce qu'a dit Madame Bocos, je pense qu'on est tout à fait en phase. Euh, je voudrais juste préciser euh, deux points. Pourquoi est-ce que je vais parler des populations clés Parce que comme partout ailleurs, on parle beaucoup de la société civile, des populations clés, c'est une belle case à cocher. Mais je pense qu'en fait, il faut aller plus loin que cocher la case. Il s'agit ici de prendre en compte les besoins des patients, les besoins des personnes qui ne vont pas vers les systèmes de santé, qu'il faut aller chercher, auprès de qui il faut aller euh, chercher la parole. Donc amener cette innovation auprès des populations les plus marginalisées reste notre combat. Bien sûr, le Fonds mondial a prouvé son efficacité pour amener un certain nombre d'outils, un certain nombre d'innovations auprès des populations, euh, notamment à travers son... Euh, son mécanisme de, de financement d'achat groupé qui a permis à beaucoup de pays d'avoir accès à, à pas mal d'outils et de médicaments, même si on peut en contester un petit peu euh, l'appropriation par le pays, ça reste quand même quelque chose de très centralisé au niveau de Genève. Et il y aurait encore des efforts à faire au niveau des pays. Notre coalition s'est beaucoup battue en France et ailleurs euh, contre l'abus des groupes pharmaceutiques dans l'accès justement à ces médicaments. Je parlerai, peut-être je mentionnerai juste Gilead et l'accès au Trouvada pour être rapide, mais je pense que vous savez tous de quoi on veut parler. Il y a un point qui m'intéresse plus particulièrement, c'est l'innovation. Elle existe bien souvent au Nord, comme le dirait la présidente de Coalition Plus, le professeur Imich. Ce qui est important pour nous, c'est que l'innovation qui est disponible au Nord soit accessible au Sud. Sinon, encore une fois, elle ne sert pas à grand chose. 
Je voudrais juste reprendre rapidement euh, l'exemple de l'accès à la PrEP au Maroc et mes collègues de l'ALCS qui sont dans la salle pourront répondre bien mieux que moi aux questions. Mais je voudrais quand même mentionner que grâce au Fonds mondial, euh, le Maroc a pu euh, mettre en place une étude qui a montré bien sûr la faisabilité scientifique, elle n'était pas du tout approuvée, mais l'acceptabilité dans le pays. Et on pense que c'est vers là qu'il faut aller. Comment est-ce qu'on met en place ces innovations qui sont déjà accessibles ailleurs euh, et qui, pour plein de raisons, ne sont pas forcément toujours accessibles dans dans les pays du Sud. Juste une petite parenthèse, je ne sais pas si vous avez vu que l'État de Californie a récemment mis à disposition la PrEP et la PEP sans prescription médicale. C'est une belle avancée. Je pense que ça nous donne pas mal d'idées à tous ici. Je voudrais continuer ce propos sur, bien sûr, la nécessité de financer le Fonds mondial et de continuer à faire en sorte que la société civile aussi puisse être partie prenante, parce qu'on s'aperçoit que quand le Fonds mondial sort des pays, ce qu'on appelle les phases de transition, euh, les pays sont laissés à eux-mêmes et du coup, on a besoin de, de plaideurs dans les pays pour aider les pays à continuer à travailler auprès de ces populations, puisqu'on le sait, euh, ce ne sont pas forcément celles qui sont ciblées par les gouvernements. Pour être rapide et, euh, et terminer ce propos, je voudrais aussi euh, parler justement dans les pays de, de quoi avons-nous besoin au niveau du gouver des gouvernements. Bien sûr, euh, d'avoir une législation et des conditions requises pour qu'on puisse acheter des médicaments de bonne qualité, qu'il y ait de la transparence dans les, euh, dans les, dans les procédures d'achat qui soient... Euh, en lien avec les directives de l'OMS, mais aussi changer peut-être l'état d'esprit parfois. On l'a vu dans le cadre de la démédicalisation que nous prenons beaucoup. En fait, sans cette démédicalisation et sans l'accès aux tests rapides, aux TROD, comme on dit en français, euh, qui sont faits par les communautés, on ne touche pas les populations qui sont les plus à risque de transmission. Encore une fois, ce sont celles qui ne vont pas euh, dans les centres de santé. Et il est important que les pays puissent soutenir la société civile dans ce travail-là. On l'a rappelé, le Fonds mondial a été un partenaire historique de tous ses efforts, avec très rapidement et dès sa création, une place à la table des discussions pour la société civile, puis un petit peu plus tard avec le vote en 2005 des communautés. On espère que ça va continuer, mais avec des ressources suffisantes. On n'est pas encore tout à fait aux 14 milliards. On remercie bien sûr tous les pays du G7 qui ont déjà fait des pledges qui vont dans ce sens. On attend beaucoup de notre président français. Euh, et on espère surtout que la France va être à la hauteur de ses engagements historiques dans l'innovation, dans l'accès au traitement. Elle a été le, un des fondateurs du Fonds mondial, un gros, un gros supporter d'United. De, de, Donc on compte sur notre président pour être à la hauteur des enjeux. Merci. Merci. So. Thank you to our panel. Um, I'm going to ask now our first, uh, our first innovation panel. So may I thank you all, actually applaud everybody because um, you, you've given us a wonderful policy steer. And Minister, we'll, we'll call you back to join us later for, for, for your contribution. Thank you. Uh, so if I could ask the members of our, our first panel to join us. Um, uh, so, uh, Velo, uh, Professor Dabi, uh, Renu Kagade and Tom. There we are. Wonderful. As you like. Uh, uh, com com completely as you like. Um, so I, I, I'll very briefly, I know you all have copies of the agenda, so I'll, I'll very briefly uh, introduce our panel uh, who, are, who are going to address the subject of development. Now, I, I think you're going to hear three themes that will cross over both of our panels here today. We thought there would be a nice, neat division between uh, developing new tools for global health and introducing them. In, in fact, of course, that's not true. Uh, and you'll hear in both panels, uh, people talk about the need for regulatory flexibility and adaptation, uh, particularly as we enter an era uh, of, of big data and of uh, uh, tailored uh, therapies. You'll hear t people talk about new ways of rolling out innovation uh, to, to affected communities. And you'll hear a great deal about the need for earlier and more precise demand forecasting. 
So those themes will run across our tables, but each of our, our participants will bring you something, I think, uh, a, a unique perspective. So uh, if I may, from, from, from this end to this end, uh, Villo Brock is the uh, uh, Senior Vice President for External Affairs of the TB Alliance. Uh, Tom McLean is the uh, Market Access Director of the International Vector Control Consortium. Uh, Professor Francois Dabi is the uh, uh, President France Recherche Nord et Sud, SIDA à VIH et Appetit at ANRS. Uh, and uh, Renuka Gade is the Vice President for Global Health at BD. Uh, so I'm going to invite each of them to speak in turn. Um, I think if we may, um, we'll start, uh, if we may, Professor Dabi, with you. Uh, um, Est-ce que je peux vous poser une un question qu'on a discuté? Um, est que, que, quel enseignement peut-on tirer du projet Opéra que vous avez euh, fait euh, entre la ANRS et l'Unité, si, 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 si je comprends bien. Et, euh, et euh, est-ce qu'il y, est qu y a des enseignements concernant le, les moyens d'identifier les projets de RAD qui sont pertinents aux pays qui ont une forte charge de VIH et d'autres maladies Merci. Et euh, donc je continue en français, n'est-ce hein, pas hein alors, euh, oui, l'exemple que vous m'avez demandé de, de développer, il est, il est assez euh, révélateur, puisque la question qu'on se posait il y a quelques années, c'était euh, euh, comment atteindre le troisième 90, hein, c'est-à-dire euh, garantir que les personnes VIH traitées ont une charge virale contrôlée euh, dans des pays euh, où euh, les kits commerciaux euh, euh, de charge virale sont des systèmes qui sont fermés, euh, qui sont complexes qui sont coûteux et donc hors de portée des programmes nationaux qui, les, qui veulent les, les avoir. Je pense que c'était le cas il y a quelques années dans la plupart des pays d'Afrique de l'Ouest et d'Afrique du centre. Donc est-ce qu'on peut aller contre une question, comme ce, contre une problématique comme ceci en partant à l'envers, c'est-à-dire de dire est-ce qu'on peut développer par l'innovation des systèmes qui soient ouverts au, au lieu qu'ils soient fermés euh, qui soit plutôt polyvalent, hein, donc euh, qui puisse s'adapter euh, et bien sûr qui soit les moins chers possibles parce qu'on utiliserait des composants, on va dire, génériques. Euh, alors cette question, elle est venue des chercheurs. Euh, elle est venue de chercheurs euh, français, virologues, euh, qui travaillaient sur ces sujets de, de, de suivi de la charge virale euh, en France. Euh, elle est venue du fait que la, la NRS était une agence publique et donc pouvait développer ces idées-là sans aucune, sans aucune contrainte euh, particulière euh, et qu'elle avait un réseau de partenaires africains euh, importants dans les pays où elle, euh, elle travaillait. Alors, ce n'était pas suffisant parce que pour développer un tel concept et développer une idée comme celle-ci, il fallait aussi au moins un partenaire industriel euh, et puis il fallait certainement des moyens que moi, à l'agence, je n'avais pas. Euh, et donc, on a fait un partenariat avec Unitaid pour développer ce type de, ce type de, ce type de, de produit. Alors au bout de cinq ans, qu'avons-nous fait D'abord, on a travaillé dans quatre pays d'Afrique, ce qui est quand même intéressant, quatre pays qui tous étaient dans la catégorie des pays les moins favorisés que j'ai indiqué tout à l'heure, euh, le Burundi, euh, le Cameroun, euh, la Côte d'Ivoire euh, et la Guinée. Et on peut dire qu'au bout de cinq ans, dans ces pays, on a incontestablement, là où on a travaillé, augmenté la demande très forte de la part des professionnels de santé qui, il y a cinq ans, ne voyaient absolument pas comment utiliser la charge virale. On a formé, bien sûr, beaucoup de professionnels de laboratoire, mais aussi des cliniciens qui devaient s'approprier toutes, toutes ces connaissances, mis en place des systèmes ouverts, donc comme je l'ai dit, dans à peu près une douzaine d'hôpitaux, ce qui n'est pas du tout négligeable, c'est-à-dire à un niveau relativement périphérique. Et tout ça en permettant de rendre des résultats pour des pour à peu près 200 000 personnes vivant avec le VIH de manière rapide et, et, et de proximité. Et donc certainement l'objectif général qu'avait ce projet qui était d'avoir un impact sur le marché euh, de la charge virale, c'est-à-dire de ces kits euh, aujourd'hui, a été atteint. Euh, Peut-être pas exactement comme on l'attendait, mais en tout cas il a beaucoup permis de en tout cas, contribuer à ce que le prix euh, des kits de charge virale commerciaux 
baisse énormément. Et donc finalement, la différence entre les produits polyvalents euh, et ouverts euh, n'est peut-être pas encore si bas que ça par rapport aux, aux kits commerciaux. Mais on a vu l'offre commerciale d'une manière générale baisser considérablement en prix, ce qui reste un, un, énorme, un, énorme, un énorme impact, euh, je pense, de ce, de ce projet. Euh, je ne, je ne cache pas que la plus grande difficulté a été de passer à l'échelle, car il est très difficile de trouver des industriels qui veulent s'engager vers ce type de partenariat. En fait, un seul industriel a réussi à enregistrer l'ensemble du, du, du processus. Et le, le, le côté polyvalent, on l'a développé pour le VIH de type 2, après le VIH de type 1, et maintenant pour l'hépatite B. Donc il y a une forme déjà de polyvalence qui est, qui est, qui, qui, qui est en place. Donc... Des résultats, enfin, je pense, un concept, une, une réflexion intéressante. Au bout du compte, des, des résultats attendus pour la population cible, mais des difficultés incontestables dans le passage de l'innovation à l'échelle. Mais c'est un exemple euh, intéressant de comment quelque chose développé pour le VIH peut être utilisé dans les autres maladies. Oui, vous avez raison. C'était d'ailleurs euh, un des principes, j'ai envie de dire, de la philosophie de ce type de technologie, de les rendre polyvalentes, ce qui n'est bien sûr pas souvent le cas euh, lorsqu'on parle de, 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 de développement strictement commerciaux. So I did promise you, you would all be uh, disappointed and I, I think we could discuss this for the next 20 minutes, but, uh, but, but thank you, Professor Debbie, that, that's fascinating. Um, I'd like to move now... Um, Uh, to, to Ranuka Gade, if I may. And, and Ranuka, a, a, a slightly related question, really. Um, you know, uh, Professor Dabi ended by saying it's difficult to get industry involved. Uh, when you, as a senior manager at a, at a global diagnostics company, think about where to invest not just your money, but your management attention, your, your, your focus, your, your human capacity, How do you decide where to make those investments and where not to? How to apportion the resources? Thank you. It's a, it's a complex answer because the question is a complex one. Uh, you really don't want to know what goes on in the boardroom when we're making these decisions. But before... <laughs> Are you sure? <laughs> well, so before I start, I want to say companies care and we are all in this together because we want to play our part in solving complex global health problems. So let's take that as a given. It might be hard, you might not get the attention, but it's not because companies don't care. The very fact that I see several private sector colleagues in this audience itself is a testimony to say why we care. Having said that, there are many factors that make up a decision, right? Um, clearly, business case, when you have a negative return on something that you can't see as a sustainable solution, even if you want to do good, it does not allow you to play. So very challenging business cases is one thing. And I know you said it in your opening remarks, we have an upstream innovation and then a downstream innovation. And I think they're all connected, it's a cycle. I can sit here giving you examples of technologies that we work with PDPs that were super successful and technologies that have failed as well. So what made the super successful solutions, if I look at dating back to our very first PDP collaboration with PATH, with the auto-disabled syringes, which is still relevant today, um, or with FIND, since I see Katharina on scaling, a rather sophisticated technology for a TB culture system, um, but reaching the vulnerable uh, through innovative models. All of this was possible because we had a third party partner. So when you're talking about reaching vulnerable innovations, I don't think anyone can do it alone, not even a big company, because it's complicated. So you need to have a collaborative partner. You need to look at not just upstream, but also downstream to make the case because there have been several technologies and innovations that made it through the upstream, the first valley of death, but then died because the second valley of death, the downstream, couldn't be figured out. So as I heard uh, the previous panel speak saying how PDPs are working together um, to make sure that you are approaching innovations uh, collectively, I think every innovation should have an extension of looking at not just upstream, but also downstream, so that companies can actually play their part of doing good and doing well. 
And, and, and we should just explain for anybody not familiar with it, there are these two concepts that there is, uh, after a good idea is developed, there's what's called a valley of death, meaning the, the, the money isn't there to take it into the bigger trials Correct. that are necessary. And then people often talk about a second valley of death, meaning you can't develop it to be used by the communities who would benefit. Correct. And I, exactly. So if you look at the, to explain and bring to life both those um, examples of a device, because that's coming to my mind very quickly, an auto-disabled syringe, um, we developed this in a call from WHO to say um, injection reuse is a big challenge in LMICs and vulnerable populations. And there was data at that point for vaccination where children under two were getting HIV AIDS. So how do we stop it? Build in a technology that prevents injection reuse that locks upon injection. PATH, the PDP, had some ideas already working on it. We partnered with them. We took this to scale. We did the clinicals, we took this to scale, invested in manufacturing. But we really hit the second valley of death because I think the first auto-disabled study was done in 1991. And it wasn't until 2000 or so that we actually saw scale. And that's because of the establishment of Gavi, uh, WHO, American Red Cross, UNFPA, came up with a policy mandating um, so auto-disabled use in immunization programs. UNICEF was established as a procurement arm for scale. And lo and behold, from that point in time to now, BD alone has safely vaccinated six billion children globally. And that would not be possible with just one industry partner or just one PDP. It's the coming together, looking at a holistic end-to-end uh, -end solution that can really help overcome some of these challenges. So Tom, we, we, we may have learned a little bit about this meeting, uh, from this meeting, about how to at least help overcome some of those challenges, right, in terms of providing guarantees about, about volume to improve access and, and how that can guide developers in, in, in making those decisions uh, about where to invest, whether, whether it's uh, state institutions like the INRS or, or private companies, about where to invest their, their precious capital. Indeed it can. And so uh, I'm Tom McLean from IVCC, which is the Vector Control Product Development Partnership. And around 80% of the lives saved in the last 15 years or so uh, by the, the, the Global Fund and the efforts that we're here to hear about in the next few days uh, has actually been driven in the malaria world by preventing people from catching malaria in the first place by controlling the mosquitoes. And that's been done by the huge success of the bed nets and indoor residual spraying that's been done. But that's under threat from resistance within the mosquito population to the insecticides that are out there. So that leaves us with the question of how do we bring new insecticides that are just as expensive and complicated to develop as drugs into th this marketplace? And exactly as you've heard earlier on, that is all to do with collaboration. Collaboration across industry, collaboration with the global partners, collaboration with the, f the funders. And uh, I'm very happy to hear in the last uh, few months about some really wonderful new opportunities for collaboration, particularly with the WHO coming forward with this office for R&D and this new focus and new energy behind the idea of innovation within the WHO and the meeting, a really excellent meeting that Marika referred to uh, in July. I was at that meeting and I can attest that it really did have a, a great energy and a sense that the community coming together had the opportunity to innovate within the processes that it was driving forward. One of the things that is really a very strong enabler within that is that the industrial partners that we need as part of this collaboration to develop the products and to manufacture and distribute them need to have confidence that the marketplace that they are bringing these products into will be stable and sustainable. Sustainable means both affordable for the country and also uh, in a cost position that is survivable for the manufacturer. They can't give it away. So one of the things that has been very effective over the last few years in achieving that kind of thing is the application of volume guarantees. And I'm very happy to be able to report today on an announcement that was made this morning of a collaboration between uh, our partners at MedAccess and the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, 
working with uh, an industrial partner of IVCC, BASF, on a new generation of net uh, which overcomes resistance to the pyrethroid uh, insecticide, in which the Global Fund working with UNITAID were working to bring pilot studies of these uh, through into the marketplace, and the volume guarantee that has come with MedAccess allows us to almost double the scale that we are doing that. So ha now we see partnership uh, across all of the, fund the big funders, uh, Global Fund, UNITAID, PMI, working with some of the people who focus very much at the, the, some of the specialist end of this funding, MedAccess and the Gates Foundation, looking at the, the, uh, the, uh, at the, the volume guarantee, enabling and empowering uh, an innovation that is driven by a PDP. And one of the things that is very clear to us is that that has uh, energized many of our other partners who now say, ah, now we have confidence that the world will actually support these products coming through. That, that enables us to invest in the R&D and the upstream work that, that is going on. So it's, it's a very powerful tool. It's something that we in this room can do and bring to the marketplace that gives us then access to a lot more resources within the, the companies to bring products forward. And if we had time, I, I, know, I know you'd like to stress that it's important that in its next phase, the Global Fund sets aside money to do more of this, to, to, to accommodate more new technologies that we don't yet foresee, so. Indeed, I will, I will happily say to anybody that will listen that uh, the, the Global Fund's funding of innovation, particularly the work that they've done through the Catalytic Fund already, has been immensely productive but there are opportunities to do more and given the great uh, wave of things that are coming, very exciting products coming in the pipeline, we need to think about how the sustainability of those is going to be achieved as those products hit the marketplace. Which perfectly transitions, as if we had planned it, to the, to the second, to what Villa wants to talk about in terms of how the Global Fund uh, ca can uh, accommodate global goods, how, how the Global Fund is positioned to steer that, given its strong focus on countries, and it, it, which is seen as a great strength of the Global Fund, but its strong focus on countries and the country coordinating mechanisms. So how can it use that? Yeah, so um, it's interesting. I mean, obviously, if you have a, a Dutch representative that's slightly provocative saying we're not going to go in innovation, and then you have... <laughs> A Dutch, a, Dutch a Dutch representative of a PDP countering that argument, uh, it, it may, may lead to a discussion. Yeah, obviously it's true. So the Global Fund's strength is in its country coordination mechanisms. It's in its strong relationships with national governments. However, when you look at product development, and the more complex products have more of that, it's, it's a global good. We, we've just registered a new um, drug regimen uh, for severe drug-resistant TB that brings treatment back from 18 to 24 months to six months with a 91% success rate in the, in, the, uh, in the pivotal trial. That's obviously a, a big breakthrough. We didn't do that in one country. Um, that was a large investment that not one country contributed. A lot of donors, a lot of countries, and a lot of scientists from around the world work on that. So I think you're making that transition between these products that are developed as a global good to national level. And I think that transition is something where Unitate has played a big role in, where Global Fund effectively plays a role in. Um, what I think we're arguing here partly is that there is uh, often a reactive point in that. I mean, there is demand by, uh, by the Global Fund. It's one of the largest procurer effectively of drugs, um, of diagnostic tools, of vaccines. Um, if we were to wait for that demand to naturally occur, it takes a lot longer than if you could preempt that. And I think that's the bridge which we need to try to make. Um, and some of that is um, volume guarantees, which I completely agree would be uh, an important asset. But it's also some of the very practical rules that institutions by its setup have, have created. Um, why necessarily wait with your preparations of a product until WHO has issued guidance? We know that that process takes a year. In that process, that has to happen. But I think waiting for that process to happen and then start your introduction planning just loses a lot of time and that's a lot of lives. In, in TV, we're talking tens of thousands of lives by waiting a year. Um, but also from a global fund perspective, if we know that 2% of the patients in TB 
represent 29% of the budgets for treating TB when you have drug resistance. You can make an enormous increase in your value for money by introducing these products as, as quick as possible. Um, and I'm not saying that obviously Global Fund should start funding those last stage uh, clini uh, clinical trials or uh, fund some of that innovation. But together with Unitate, there's, there's a massive role that can be leveraged to ensure that these products get faster into, into the hands of patients. And, and it may be that the Global Fund can use its very sophisticated um, country coordinating mechanisms to, to feed back to developers on what demand is likely to be and what priorities are likely to be in countries. If, if yeah, I think it would be very helpful. Um, and I think there is obviously that feedback loop is, being, is trying to be made. But understanding the process of planning for countries, uh, exposing also ministries of health to innovations that are coming down the pipeline, will help also give feedback to say, hey, this is an issue for us that we really want you to invest in. And this is an issue which may be a nice to have, but not to focus. So the feedback loop works two ways. And I think that's, again, where uh, these country mechanisms will, will be very valuable to, uh, to product developers. Well, I have to thank our first panel. And uh, uh, thank you for leaving us wanting so much more. I'm sure uh, that we will hear more over the next uh, few days. But these have been really fascinating examples. And uh, thank you. Thank you all very much indeed. Thank you. Could I, could I ask our second panel to join us? <laughs> so uh, if I can, uh, thank you very much. And Minister, there we are. <laughs> so, um, so you, you're, you're going to uh, rejoin us, I think, for this panel, I, if you would. Thank you. Um, so if I may introduce our panel members, um, uh, just uh, fr from this side to this side, uh, Dr. Bernard Pecor, who uh, the ambassador mentioned earlier, who's the executive director of, uh, of uh, DNDI. Uh, and uh, is indeed one of the giants of our field, so it's, a great, it's, it's great to have you with us here. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, the Chief of Staff of Unitaid, uh, Sana Venders, uh, who has uh, um, uh, been mentioned a number of times, Unitaid has already come up in a number of the discussions. Um, Sherwin Charles, the CEO and co-founder of Goodbye Malaria, uh, and uh, for those of you with a, a, an interest in food, uh, his background uh, is he comes from Nando's, which uh, the, the, the number of people who have an obsession about Nando's, so I, I, I felt obliged to mention it. Uh, and, and finally, the Minister of Health of Zambia, um, His Excellency Dr. Chitalu Chilufia. And Dr. Chilufia uh, is, uh, puts us all to shame because he's not only a medical doctor but has an MBA. Uh, so he's in a position to discuss this from from a policymaker point of view, a business point of view, and a medical point of view. So we're honored to have you all with us. Um, and uh, we, 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 we really do appreciate you taking the time. Um, if I could, um, I, I'd like to start, um, Sherwin, with you, if I may. Um, I know that uh, y you have been working in Goodbye Malaria to address some of the gaps that we heard about in, in our first panel and that you've been looking at, at uh, ways of using private and donor resources to help introduce uh, new technologies in HIV, TB, and malaria in several countries in Southern Africa. Can you? Thanks, Mark. Um, I think we have a public-private partnership um, in Southern Africa um, around malaria, which gives us a unique opportunity um, and ability to encourage the use of new technology and innovation uh, within the region. Obviously, we've started an elimination discussion um, in a country like Mozambique, where really the burden of disease is high, and Mozambique has been identified as a high burden, um, high impact country. But what we've seen is that the introduction of the new technology uh, using not only donor funds but private sector money has had a massive impact in our journey towards um, zero malaria. I think the other important element in terms of this 
public-private partnership is that as entrepreneurs in Africa, uh, we've been able to build a global brand. It's been easy for us to look and see the opportunity for how these innovations can come into country. What is needed to make them sustainable, to make them fundable? Um, how do we get them, um, get the word out there? on the benefit of these new technologies. And in looking at the report that was generated uh, in terms of some of the, um, the, the questions that need to be answered, what are some of the, the roadblocks? A couple um, I, I noted, one was the low awareness and demand among healthcare professionals and users in country, to lazy in-country in implementation, not enough local R&D, and obviously the funding. As entrepreneurs, those are issues we deal with all the time. And so the great thing for us is to be able to look at these innovations and to guide the PDPs and innovators into how to bring them to market and have the ability to actually test it on the ground. And, and you say, I mean, it's, it's an interesting point you make that, that these are core entrepreneurial skills. These are skills that uh, are transferable from from businesses which depend on healthy, thriving workforces and communities. So I suppose there's a, there's a sort of dual thing you bring. It's not just money, it's that sense of how to promote sustainable businesses in those communities. Abs absolutely. I think um, it's not just only healthy workforces, but um, as most of you, I hope, would have enjoyed Nando's, a big part of, of the of, of the company is around purpose. And in identifying the purpose within Nando's, the first and most important thing for us was making our staff the most important stakeholder in the business. And that comes back not just to their welfare, but them understanding the greater purpose that the business has and the impact that we can have in changing lives. One of which is within healthcare, the others are in art and in music. So I think that it is an important element and part of what we do is provide staff with incentives to go and be embedded in the healthcare programs. And, and our feedback from it has been absolutely amazing. Actually has encouraged us to do a lot more, uh, thus a big increase in our commitment to the Global Fund for this replenishment. Dr. Chilufia, can, can I ask you to talk about this from a slightly different point of view? I mean, obviously you as a policymaker have to make extraordinarily difficult decisions all the time about which data to value which data to discount, about which needs to prioritize, where to put resources. What can developers, international organizations, the people in this room do to make it easier for you to make informed, precise decisions? It should be on. Thank you very much. It's OK. Uh, thank you very much. Um, like the moderator said, I'm Chitalu Chulufia, Minister of Health from Zambia. I'm privileged to serve under uh, a president who has shown unprecedented political will for health for all. And uh, he's invested in very strong health systems in pursuit of universal health coverage. And so I'm a privileged health minister because I have that support at the summit. In responding to uh, your question, uh, first of all, I must state that innovation is critical for us to successfully uh, wage war against HIV, TB, and malaria. However, as we develop these innovations, we should ensure that uh, the transformative tools are embraced in national health systems. And uh, we must re-engineer our health systems to reposition them to respond to the new uh, developments in the health sector. So I will state here that, um, first of all, we must recognize in the resource constraint settings that uh, preventing diseases and promoting wellness is key. So as we talk about innovation, we must innovate in the way we deliver healthcare. We must place premium on health promotion. So we need to re-engineer our health service delivery model. As we talk of universal health coverage, we must speak of access to health services across the whole continent, beginning with health promotion. Innovative engagement with communities is key. 
if we innovatively engage with communities through religious leaders, through traditional leaders, through teachers, or in the spirit of health no policy, we will ensure that the innovations trickle down and there is high impact. In Zambia, we've seen a lot of benefit through effective community engagement and through innovative community engagement. And I'll speak briefly about HIV, malaria, and TB. We have seen new tools in uh, HIV practice. Uh, we have seen that with uh, the introduction of deletographer-based regimens, we have seen that viral load is suppressed quickly. We've also seen that with introduction of self-testing kits, which are all good innovations, the uptake of HIV testing is improved. So having introduced self-testing kits, having had the president announce the policy of test and treat, uh, we have seen that the number of people who started testing and knowing their status just surged. Secondly, having introduced the autographer based regimens, we also saw that compliance had improved. And as we speak, Zambia has moved in the UNH targets to 90, 92, 88, which is attributable to the innovations that we've seen and embracing these innovations. And we believe that by working with the religious leaders, with other communities in congregate settings, the uptake of these new innovations has improved. Secondly, on malaria, we saw, for instance, the introduction of rectal artesanate as a peripheral treatment in children in a rural community, that it reduced mortality by 96%. Now, this has been at pilot phase. So it is important that we find resources to roll it out. In Zambia, we have adopted it in our policy, and what we are looking for is partnership to ensure that we can finance rectal attestinate as a peripheral treatment. Now, this is an example of how innovative tools, innovations, can power the drive towards elimination of public health nuisances such as malaria. Secondary on malaria, when you look at um, a prophylaxis using DHAP, this has also shown that you accelerate towards elimination if you use DHAP as prophylaxis. Again, that's a good innovation. If you involve the community in case management, in surveillance, that helps a lot. So this is a careful mix between innovative tools that are being developed and also community engagement. Lastly, on TB, if you look at the, the new machines for diagnosis, such as Gene Expert, rolled out in the rural parts of the country, you will see that you are better able to diagnose and better able to initiate people on treatment. In Zambia, we have seen w an increase in treatment success from 85 to 90 percent, um, you know, for uh, drug, for, for, for TB that is re responsive to normal drugs and also drug resistant TB, we've also an increase in an improvement from 31 percent to 71 percent. By introducing shorter regimens, again, as a result of innovation, we have also seen that the treatment success is also improving. So I conclude by emphasizing that these innovative tools, new health products, need to summon a coalition of partners for improved healthcare financing. Also need to summon nations to improve resource mobilization locally. Innovative resource mobilization. In Zambia, we've introduced a new law, compulsory health insurance which is a more predictable way of raising resources for finance, for financing healthcare. And it's also important that as we embrace new tools, innovation, we reform our health systems, strengthen them, make them resilient to pursue universal health coverage. And that way we shall succeed. And thank you. Thank you. That was an absolutely fascinating insight into how, how policy decisions are made. Um, if I could get you to pass the microphone down, I'm going to ask Dr. Pekul, um, Il a fallu plus de, de deux décennies pour développer de meilleures formulations de médicaments anti-VIH euh, pédiatriques. Au moment que plusieurs nouvelles formulations optimisées, optimisées sont sur le point d'être enregistrées, comment ces modèles d'approvisionnement du Fonds mondial et du, du PEPFA pourraient-ils mieux fonctionner pour servir les patients que le ministre a, a, a discuté Merci beaucoup. Euh, donc pour resituer le contexte, euh, euh, la, les populations euh, d'enfants atteints de sida sont vraiment une population négligée. Hein. Depuis 20 ans, elles, elles, elles ont le choix entre un régime à base nevirapide qui n'est pas très efficace, 
euh, ou un régime euh, à base de l'opinavir et tonavir, qui est un sirop euh, à base d'alcool, le solvant et l'alcool. Euh, le goût est déplorable et il faut euh, maintenir euh, le produit dans, 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 une, dans une chaîne de froid. Donc aujourd'hui, euh, après des années d'efforts, et, et bien entendu, parce qu'il euh, n'y avait pas de de motivation euh, de développer ces formulations euh, pédiatriques par, à cause de l'absence du marché. Donc le, le fameux euh, incentive qui est le, euh, le marché ne fonctionnait pas dans la pédiatrie. Donc aujourd'hui, euh, on voit le bout du tunnel, on voit des nouvelles formulations à base de l'opinavir et de la vire, le 4 en 1 qu'on a développé avec CIPLA et le support de l'Unitaid, mais aussi des formulations à base de l'utégravir qui devraient arriver dans les prochains mois. Donc l'enjeu, c'est de s'assurer euh, que ces produits soient disponibles rapidement. Là, je ne je ne parle pas des, des guides thérapeutiques parce que je pense qu'ils sont prêts à être changés. Je parle surtout de, de niveau d'enregistrement des produits au niveau des pays et de, euh, de procurement et, et pro, pro, probablement euh, d'achat euh, facilité pour les entreprises. Il ne faut pas s'attendre à ce que les entreprises aient, aient une, une attitude de marketing très, 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 très poussée dans ce domaine-là puisqu'on parle de niches, de populations qui sont négligées dans le domaine du SIDA. Donc là, il y a euh, un espoir, mais en espérant euh, aussi que les acteurs seront au rendez-vous pour accélérer euh, cette mise en œuvre. Right. Thank you very much. I think one of the two major things I'll talk about today that are important are partnership um, along the whole value chain and throughout the process, and also having an end-to-end -end portfolio look at it, and not just looking at individual projects, but realizing you might need a lot of different pieces of the puzzle to succeed in getting the impact that we're really looking at. So Unitaid works at identifying what the gaps and challenges are in the global response to meet the goals that we've set ourselves. And very clearly, pediatrics across the three diseases is a major bottleneck. And Bernard spoke about this, the minister spoke about this as well. These are markets, from a market perspective, what we could call broken markets, because there is no incentive. The demand is so dispersed onto different countries that manufacturers find it um, overwhelming, if you will, to find and look at, in, uh, at developing the, the products here. And maybe for pediatrics uh, TB, the, the, the situation was also different, was that the burden of disease lies within countries that may, many of the companies are not seeing as their core market areas, where we're living in and where we are right now are markets that are not influenced by TB. We don't have children with TB many of them at least in our part of the world, if you will. So it became a priority for Unitaid back in, in about 2012, 2013. And we said, what can we do about this? And where can we, can we find a, a, a pediatric dispersible version of a drug that is adapted? Mm -hmm. Currently, the, situ or the, si the point of time, the situation was that you were using adult versions of these drugs and taking the pills and crushing them, trying to mix them into yogurt and give them to children. And if any of us who have children know how difficult it is to get them to take medicine, imagine how bitter that is, resulting in children vomiting, not getting the right um, doses, creating resistance, and et cetera. So this was, a, this was a major problem. Let's not forget that a quarter million uh, of a million of children die of TB every year. So this is a substantial number of children who are affected by this. There was a WHO recommendation, so this is an example of where we had a recommendation, but there was not uptake of this drug. So we needed to find a new solution to this. We went out with a call for proposals, selected a project together with TB Alliance, who spoke earlier about the, uh, on the panel earlier, and WHO, the STEP TB project, $17 million project to go out and find and, and develop a new formulation of pediatric um, TB drugs. It was developed in 11 months with a, uh, an Indian 
generic manufacturer, strawberry taste, which is something that most children do like, dispersible and liquid. Um, and this project not only developed the product, but actually the research and evidence that came out of this allowed WHO to reassess the number of children that were found to have TB. At the point in time, it was estimated that half a million of, um, uh, of children, 500,000 children across the world had TB, but actually that was reassessed and doubled to say it was, uh, it was a million children. So a bigger problem than what we had found. So this project was very successful in finding these new drugs um, and, and formulating it. Today, almost 100 countries across the world are using this. Um, over 800,000 treatment courses have been purchased at this point in time. But this is where it brings, and, and that was done through partnership, through partnership together with TB Alliance, WHO, USAID, a major funder of this, the, the Stop TB Partnership and GDF, just to mention a few. And I think that's a very critical point, is that partnership that it takes to bring these things through. But that's not enough. Now we have the drug. But the problem is that about half of the cases of TB in children are not found. And we need to figure out how to find them. And part of that problem is we don't have the right tools because children cannot be diagnosed in the same way. So we need new tools. And so we're, we're investing with the University of Bordeaux in new diagnostic tools for children. The second part of that is we need to find the children. Children don't come to a TB clinic. They don't show with the same symptoms as adults do. So we need to find the children where they are, which means using child health clinics, which means using HIV clinics. And this is a project that we have together with EGPATH, a quite substantial investment of $36 million to try to find new delivery mechanisms to get these drugs to the children. And one last one is Friday this week, we signed, or earlier this week actually, I think it was, we signed a grant with uh, Stellenbosch University for $18 million to take um, and develop MDR-TB drugs as well as look at how we can get preventive treatment for children. So children really is a core uh, element of this. It's done through partnership, but it's also done through having this view of all of the building blocks that n are needed to move this forward. I do. We're here for the replenishment of the Global Fund. I do want to cite how critically important this partnership is and this element of looking at all of these parts of the value chain through to scale up with countries themselves. If you want to hear more about it, there'll be an event right after here that will talk about what that partnership also looks like. And Thank Dr. Bicol, I, I want to take 30 seconds, which I don't have, but I want to take 30 seconds because that so directly ties to something you were saying to me, that we have to accept that we're not treating diseases, we're treating patients, and we have to think differently in the universal healthcare era. Given that we have 30 yeah. seconds, can I? Yeah. Ouais, typically, and in the context uh, of couverture santé universelle, uh, j'espère que l'on va pouvoir aborder les maladies de, de manière différente, non, non seulement à travers les co-infections, mais à travers la comorbidité. C'est-à-dire, euh, ne comment euh, investir euh, massivement dans le SIDA sans prendre en charge euh, l'hépatite C, alors que les populations cibles sont souvent les mêmes. À mon avis, c'est un gâchis de ressources. Comment ne pas utiliser les, les progrès faits pour euh, atteindre les, les patients atteints de paludisme, de malaria, à travers des zones très difficiles, et ne pas en bénéficier pour traiter des maladies négligées, extrêmement sévères comme la leishmaniose, la, la maladie de sommeil, sont des maladies qui sont mortelles, dont le premier symptôme c'est la fièvre, et qu'on euh, on pourrait diagnostiquer avec des diagnostics simples et offrir des traitements qui aujourd'hui sont simples à offrir. On a des programmes verticaux pour ces maladies qui coûtent une fortune, qui consomment un, un maximum d'énergie pour les programmes nationaux, pour le, pour, le, pour le monsieur le ministre ici présent, alors qu'on pourrait aborder de manière euh, horizontale ces maladies à travers les nouvelles technologies qui sont disponibles. Et qui, qui gratte beaucoup d'enfants, comme ça a dit. Alors, merci. Thank you to, to this panel. Uh, and thank you so much. I'm going to ask David Reddy to come up and do a... Thank you so much. He's going to come and do the impossible and summarize everything you've heard in four minutes. You'll be asked to rate him at the end on a, on a scale of, of, of zero to ten. Thank you. Thanks very much, Mark, and um, don't make this a difficult task. Um, Okay, I've got down five points I'd like to cover coming out of this. So firstly, what's really exciting about today is that we've got innovators, both the PDPs and the private sector, implementers, patient advocates and government in the same room and that they've been working very effectively together. We've achieved a lot. Um, we heard the Global Fund and the Honourable Minister's comments that we need better products, we need innovation. Um, 
a key principle that we all adhere to, and we heard in different shapes and forms throughout the discussions today, were that these products, these don't become preventions or medicines until they reach the patients that need them. So we need to think end to end. We also need the global fund to achieve this. Ending the three diseases won't be possible without a fully funded global fund and domestic funding and commitment like we heard about from the Minister of Zambia. Down to the level of community involvement, which was a very important comment he made. The third point is that we need a steady pipeline of innovation, tools needed to address resistance, facilitate elimination, and also to address the underserved and vulnerable populations, particularly children. And I'd also like to add women of childbearing potential and pregnant women who are often the very last to receive interventions. The great news is that we are working together and we are being effective. But as mentioned by Katerina, there are around 55 potentially transformative products in the pipeline and how do we take our efforts to the next level to ensure that these have maximal and early impact and this is going to require better coordination, better planning, earlier planning across the entire value chain as you heard Sane mention from discussions on the target product profile, building in cost expectations, product usage, demand forecasting, and demand creation, something that's often forgotten, and innovations in delivery, funding, and scaling. My final point is what are the next steps? So as you mentioned, there was an incredibly good discussion that took place with the Global Fund, WHO, and the PDPs in Geneva on July 12th, and this was on addressing barriers to access. There are around 10 key barriers that were identified and work streams are being created to map out a path for future progress against these key barriers. WHO and the newly appointed chief scientist are strongly endorsing and involved in this process. And we ask all of you to support it and look at those work streams and join them wherever it makes sense. So, my final words are to thank you all for your commitment. This is about innovation with urgency, so let's do it. Thank you very much. I think that merits a 10 out of 10. Um, Dr. Zita Rosenberg, who couldn't be here this afternoon, um, uh, made, a, I thought, a, a wonderful point, which I want to leave with you as a final thought. She said that the Global Fund matters not only because of its procurement and supply chain expertise, but because it has done so many important new initiatives. She gives the example of the HER initiative, reaching girls and young women uh, with innovative solutions against HIV. But, but the point she wanted me to make to you is that there is this synergistic innovation between institutions like the Global Fund, especially the Global Fund, Unitaid, others, uh, and the product developers, and how vital it is uh, for us to build on that. So I'd like to thank you as an audience. You've worked very hard. We've packed a lot into an hour and a half, and I didn't see anybody close their eyes once. So uh, I'm really grateful to you. Thank you so much.